share my screen. So bear with me while I get it up. Is that working? Yes, I can see nods. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the complexities, if you like, because lots of people have this idea that um, all of these labels and things that we work with in developmental disorders are very clear and clear cut. And it's not. I think everybody comes in their own little package and it's how you understand the package of presentation that is really important. I, for one, am not a huge fan of labels, except where it helps to really understand the presentation of the child. And I do think in dual diagnosis, where you've got more than one aspect to a person, it can really help particularly to think about different therapies and things. So really important in that space. So just a few conflicts of interest. And we talk about conflicts of interest in terms of things where I might give you a biased view of something, okay? And it's really important that you ask people who present to you about conflicts of interest. I'm also the co-director of a Centre for Clinical Trials in Rare Neurodevelopmental Disorders, and we run a number of sponsored clinical trials. So that means that um, drug companies will often pay us to run clinical trials. So it's really important people are aware of that. We've got a number of trials going in epilepsy, fragile X, 22Q11, mainly with two or three drug companies supplying us with cannabidiol products. We have some gut therapies in autism, um, another neurological treatment for Rett syndrome, and another couple in the pipeline. So just so you're aware, there are multiple layers there. I'm a developmental pediatrician by background. Um, done lots of work in mental health, um, but also a sleep physician. So um, we're also doing some work with Down syndrome Queensland in the sleep space as well. So lots of um, different aspects to the stuff that I do. So it's really important. I just want to make sure everyone's really clear about what autism spectrum disorder is and give you a little bit of history behind that. I know Dawn talked a little bit about this before. So what we've generally used in Australia, um, although having trained a lot in the UK where DSM is not the preferred um, diagnostic classification, we use um, a sort of classification, if you like, to describe autism spectrum disorder. Now in Australia, for all the pros and cons, in 2013, we shifted from what people call DSM-4, Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders, and that's where autism has been classified, to DSM-5. And there was a big change in how autism was regarded in that space. So previously we had autistic disorder, we had PDD NOS, which was sort of kind of quirky, but didn't quite fit autism in lots of respects. And we had Asperger's syndrome, which was generally um, much less language impaired, but still quite impaired in the way they presented with a lot of autistic spectrum disorder features. Now, since 2013, all of that's been wrapped up into one bundle called autism spectrum disorder. Now, the word spectrum means it goes from very mild to very severe. And so there is a wide range of difficulties within the autism spectrum. And it's really important to think about that as, you know, the actual description of autism or autism spectrum disorder is not actually a disease or a disorder that is a single thing. It's more like a end point of multiple different causes that might get you to 
um, a presentation that one would describe as autism spectrum disorder. It's a bit like cerebral palsy. We use cerebral palsy as a term that describes an abnormality in tone. And you can have multiple reasons why you might have cerebral palsy. Likewise, autism spectrum disorder is very much the same. Although we know multiple sort of things that put you in high risk categories and having a genetic disorder is one of those things that will put you into a higher risk than the otherwise typically developing population. So it's based on symptoms. What we, and I'll talk through those in a little minute. There is also another um, disorder that they separated out from autistic spectrum disorder, which is called social communication disorder. And that's where a lot of children who have difficulties with social um, and communication difficulties, but don't actually get the repetitive and restrictive behaviors that is required for a diagnosis of autism spectrum might fit instead. So really to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, you must meet criteria in both the areas and it really has to be present from early childhood. There is a real push for early diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder across the board. If you talk to developmental pediatricians, diagnosing someone under about 18 months with autism spectrum disorder, which is to all intents and purposes a permanent disorder can be really tricky. And we generally on the whole, I think would prefer to describe a young infant as at high risk of autism spectrum disorder and requiring early intervention therapy, but formalize the diagnosis a little bit later. And I think that is particularly important when you have, an, have another dis developmental disorder to just think more broadly about that as time goes on. So when we think about difficulties in social communication, so you need difficulties in social communication, you need restrictive and repetitive behaviours as well. So you must have difficulties in this area to receive a diagnosis. And these signs of difficulties in these areas, and I've taken these from resources that are readily available to um, the general public. So you'll be able to find these in some of the Down syndrome resources actually. So I just wanted to talk through what was readily available so people could really understand it. So rarely using language to communicate with people. Now, when you think about a child with developmental difficulties who may have delayed language, that is different to someone who doesn't use language to communicate. So you might be delayed, but you still communicate with someone else. So a toddler that is not yet speaking very much might be trying to communicate, but actually still don't have the language to do it yet. So it's, we will often look for things like um, pointing or waving goodbye or some of those nonverbal type clues that give us a clue that that kid actually understands about communication, even if it might be, you know, waving goodbye or pointing to something they want or pointing to something that interests them. Um, and so that's a, that's a real subtlety and it's not just delayed language, it's a atypical use of language. So you might find some kids who do develop language really quite nicely and have some language, but when you actually listen to it, it's all just repeated lines from videos they've seen. So it's not actually use of language to communicate, it's just repeating something that they've heard endlessly. So for example, I saw a kid on Tuesday where he was just cycling through phrases from wiggle songs and just cycling through those without actually having any meaning behind what that was, or not a meaning I understood anyway. Sometimes there is meaning behind it, um, but not a meaning that I could understand. Some children with autism won't speak at all. They rarely respond or will struggle sometimes to engage with you when you call their name. So things like 
you know, if you're calling them to do something, they might be so interested in what they're doing, they don't disengage or transition to actually listening to something else coming from elsewhere. Um, they don't always share interests or achievements, so they might not um, show you something they've done, they might not point to a picture when you're reading a book with them, things like that that are a little bit different or only using limited facial expression. So, you know, trying to work out what, you know, your face might mean if you're upset, would they give you a cuddle or not? Or would they seek to avoid, you know, there's different sorts of things there. Um, not showing an interest in friends or having difficulties making friends. So there's lots of different ways that might manifest. So kids might appear really solitary or they may try and make friends and be very intrusive and really struggle to know where the lines in the sand are about your behaviour in social relationships. Um, and that can be really tricky for some kids. So it can be in different sort of aspects. Now, remembering that most kids will actually not develop sort of cooperative play and play with others very easily until they reach a certain developmental age of sort of three, four. So before that, people will play on their own quite um, happily. Really engage in imaginative play is another aspect. Although we do know children with autism or autistic spectrum disorder who have amazing imaginations, but really can't always connect it with the real world. And so it's really important not to take these black and white, but where there's differences between typically developing um, individuals and trying to understand that. And then what we do as developmental pediatricians is try and look at this in the context of a child who is a typically developing Down syndrome child or a child with Down syndrome that is typically developing a lot along the sort of profile we would expect for them. The other aspect that we see with children with autism is this restricted repetitive and sensory behaviours or interests. And this might be the classic lining up of toys in a particular way. Now, lots of kids at developmental ages will line up toys and trucks. That is, or blocks, you know, that is not necessarily atypical. Some of the atypical things will be actually when you look at something and how you regard it, you may be much more interested in the detail of how the wheel spins as opposed to the broader context. Um, they may speak in a repetitive way, as I said before, or have very narrow or intense interests. Um, they may be very routine orientated and always need things in the same way and really have trouble with changes to schedule or changes, transitions from one activity to another. So a sort of a child who might really have trouble stopping playing with his blocks to be able to move to um, another task, which might be, you know, um, picking up a toy, another toy or something. So they really struggle in that shifting across between things. They also may show signs of sensory um, difficulties or differences and may become distressed by everyday sounds like hair dryers or um, clothes labels or um, indeed some food textures. Um, there's a whole variety of things. Some kids can have extraordinarily exquisite hearing. And so the sort of hearing that, you know, the older I get, the duller my hearing gets in some respects. But, you know, some kids could hear an aeroplane coming much before everyone else. So it's that sensitivity. But at the same time, when it gets to a pitch that might be more typical for the rest of us, that can become very irritating for them. And so you'll see a lot of potentially irritated or irritable behaviours when kids are really struggling with sensory things. And probably the, the one that really sort of, I think, resonates with people is, you know, 
the old fingernails on the blackboard. You know, it really irritates a lot of us. There are some people it doesn't irritate at all, but it's that feeling of, oh, make it stop. And I think for some people with autism, there are certain noises or certain textures or certain feelings that just they want to try and stop. And so where you have a child that is really struggling with that sort of thing, that can be really important. So there are a new number of levels um, of severity. And so these DSM-5 is a little bit contradictory here. It says that it should not be used for funding criteria and I absolutely agree. However, the NDIS seems to have taken this on board and um, uses potentially the severity ranking um, as level one where children need support. Now, I would advocate that everybody with um, autism needs support. Level two, where they need substantial, and three, very substantial. Now, the argument with the NDIS in this perspective is actually more of the fact that what children need to be able to access the external world and that disability support. So it's about function. It should not be about level. And I argue that all the time. So, you know, if somebody is coming to you and saying, we need a label before you can get that, what you need to go back to them and say the entire principle of the NDIS was that it was about functional support for people with disabilities, not about having a label. And so that's really, really important. So I think they, these labels in autism reflect the fact that, you know, for some people, autism may only mildly affect their everyday lives. And I can guarantee you a little bit of autism is actually really good for some people. It improves focus. You know, there are a lot of very successful academics that have a little bit of autism and that focus and intense interest can sometimes stand people in really good stead. And I would argue that those people may need support in some of their social interactions, but actually they use their strengths to actually find their way in the world. And that works really well. So when we think about things that occur together, so when one talks about dual diagnosis, there are lots and lots of things that occur together when you have neurodisability of any description, okay? So this is a number of links, if you like, from this website called the Raising Children Network, which is a very useful thing for people to just go and read about different sorts of things. And you can see one of their topics there is co-occurring conditions and autism. And many, many genetic disorders have an increased incidence of autism, um, Down syndrome included, but others such as fragile X, tuberous sclerosis will also have very high incidences of autism. And it's really important to, I, I, and it may be more of a personal bias, think actually your genetics and your biology around your genetic disorder and your phenotype is sort of what comes first and autism is part of that. It occurs with that, if you like. So it's a, a little bit of a tricky thing and people will describe it potentially in really different ways. Um, interestingly, a number of difficulties also co-occur with autism and they may be eating preferences. So eating things such as restrictive eating, you know, um, in terms of kids liking specific textures or specific colours or, you know, only three sorts of food, you know, those sorts of things can all be very important to recognise. Um, sleep problems, we know um, with some of the research that we've been doing with Down Syndrome Queensland um, that kids with Down syndrome have a very high incidence of sleep problems, not just obstruction and sleep apnea, but also challenges with behavioral sleep, sleep initiation and maintenance. We know that with children with autism, 
um, seizures or epilepsy may also be um, diagnosed as well. So there's lots of different things that can come into um, those sorts of aspects. And particularly where you might have things like um, a child with Down syndrome and epilepsy and some of those behaviours I've been talking about, that would really raise some red flags with me in terms of um, thinking about whether or not this child might have an additional diagnosis of autism. Obsessionality and obsess obsessive compulsive disorder is a bit of a funny one. People talk about it, but in reality, people don't usually diagnose that until you're in your teenage years. But a lot of that rigid sort of behaviour that you see in that OCD type world may well fit with an ASD diagnosis. Now, when you think about this in context of um, children with trisomy 21, around 10% of kids might meet criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. A little bit less than some of the other genetic disorders, as I said. Um, and the trickiness is that unless you've got experience of looking or diagnosing autism in children with different cognitive abilities, it can be really tricky to make that diagnosis. So when you're seeking or looking for a diagnosis, you really do need to see somebody who has some expertise in looking at kids with atypical development or learning difficulties and ASD. So you need somebody with good experience there. You probably need some observation of the behavior of the child and how they behave both potentially at home, at school, different environments, because we know that kids will behave well in one situation and really badly in another situation. And that's not always because, you know, the school's treating them badly or, you know, they're being treated badly at home. It's kids will often behave worse at home if they hold it together at school. So kids want to achieve at schools. A lot of peer stuff goes on that, you know, actually I want to try really hard at school, but oh my gosh, by the time I get home at the end of the day, I'm absolutely exhausted and I'm going to let everyone near me have it because actually, you know, this is my safe space. And so those kids that do lose it a little bit when they come home from school or really don't seem to tolerate anything, I think it's not always that they're not managing to do it at school because sometimes those kids will really manage well at school and then just crumple when they come home. There may be other psychological factors in terms of trauma, et cetera, and thinking about those things across domains are really important. It's really important, I think, to when you're thinking about these sort of profiles is to actually understand the typical development of a child with Down syndrome. So thinking about the, the general cognitive level and that varies for kids with Down syndrome as well. But thinking about, you know, potentially some of those milestones around language because it might be that a child is having normal language development um, for a child with Down syndrome. But when you actually go into it, there's a lot more repetitive stuff and a lot more fixated things on certain interests that might flag concerns for you. Often what you see, I think, is that, you know, the behaviours become a bit challenging. And so what you see, particularly, I think, is, and it probably reflects the kids that are a little bit more severe, get diagnosed earlier, because the severity, I think, often relates to some of that irritability. Um, so it might be that challenging behaviours might be what you see first. So the kid who absolutely refuses to put their shoes on and their intensity of their reaction is so huge or the intensity of their reaction when you go to the shops or a bus goes past might be even more than you would normally expect. So 
one of the things that we sometimes see in autism, and it's particularly common in um, kids with Down syndrome and autism, is that we get often a loss of skills. So they might develop in their own sort of trajectory until somewhere between two and four, year or four years of age. And then they might drop off in their skills. And that's often around sociability or language in particular. So you might see what we call a regression around that sort of time. And that in particular is what we call a red flag in child development. So a child that was previously doing something, so previously saying a couple of words who all of a sudden stops. A child who was previously feeding themselves or requesting things or pointing and engaging in social things around a book or reading a book, and they suddenly stop doing that. Often they'll be a little bit more irritable and have less tolerance for things. So <coughs> we call that regression of developmental skill a red flag. And so those are kids that we would really like to see as developmental pediatricians earlier rather than later. I found this in the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation, and I don't know how it's generally regarded, but I really like that concept of, you know, an overlap, okay? Because there's lots of things about the behavioral pattern or phenotype that we see in Down Syndrome that I think actually um, potentially improve the outcome for kids with autism. So they, they, the, the general sort of sociability we see in kids with Down syndrome may in fact ameliorate a little bit some of the lack of sociability we see in autism. So there's pros and cons. And I don't believe in actually trying to squish any kid into a particular box. These are just things that we see in some kids and your child, if you're worried about autism, may have some, one, none, many of these features. So it's really important to just think about that. So some of the things that children with autism and children with Down syndrome have in common may be some of those insistence on routines and insistence on sameness. Um, they may not react, always respond to their name or directions. It's really important if someone is not responding to name and directions to make sure you get their hearing checked first is before you start chasing down all sorts of things. They may have limited expressive language or use some stereotypic or that which just means patterns of language. Um, and it's really important to understand where that fits in normal or typical development in a child with Down syndrome and where it's atypical. They may have poor eye contact at times, may have some sensory issues, may engage in some repetitive play, may have restricted interests, et cetera. Things that are a little bit different in autism is where children might really don't have interest in communicating with others. Okay, so these ones in the autism yellow bet are probably the things that might flag a little bit more when you're talking about Down syndrome with autism, okay? A general lack of interest in people, no use of gestures, and that regression thing I was talking about is really important. A total lack of verbal communication, coupled with other no real attempts at using, you know, gestures or pointing or anything else. Treating people as inanimate objects. So the sort of child who will see something they want and they'll walk over strangers to get it is kind of um, what a typical example of that would be. And odd behaviours such as smelling objects or you know, some self-injurious or self-stimulatory behaviour, they fit very much around that autism spectrum disorder um, things, which are not commonly seen features in kids that have Down syndrome alone. So children in, with Down syndrome are generally recognised to be interested in people and really acknowledge others' contact, even if they can't necessarily, even if they don't necessarily have the language, there's an interest there. 
they'll often have better attention or joint attention. So we'll play with you a little bit more with toys at whatever developmental level is appropriate. And they may be able to use gestures to support that expressive language, whereas a child with autism may not be able to do that. That, that clue around those kids who will attempt to imitate others is really important as well, because often kids with autism don't, but it's a particular strength if you do have a diagnosis of autism. So children with Down syndrome and ASD are more likely to have that history of developmental regression, including those loss of language and social skills, poor communication of skills, some of that self-injurious and disruptive behaviour um, you might see in more severely disabled kids with their autism, repetitive behaviours, funny vocalisations, grunting, humming, throaty sorts of noises that are not uncommon, um, and some unusual sensory things, feeding problems, and that irritability I talked about. However, kids with Down syndrome and autism do score better in some areas than kids with typical autism. So particularly around sensory functioning, social relating, um, object use and some of their social skills. So they're a bit less impaired in that social relatedness. And this is where some of the diagnostic things might be a little bit hard unless someone's got some experience in that space, particularly with milder children um, who may have better social skills in the context of their autism than you would otherwise expect in a neurocognitively able kid with autism. So there, there might be less of that social impairment. They're a little bit, children with Down syndrome and ASD often are a little bit more preoccupied with body movements and objects than kids with ASD alone. Um, and children, even among those with Down syndrome, even those with severe intellectual disability don't always meet criteria for autism. So it's, it's a, not always entirely clear. So I just wanted to move on a little bit. Um, I think we're going okay. I um, want to leave a little bit of time for Sarah, sorry. Um, the, one of the most important things is that if you've got a disability and it's more severe, it's more easy to diagnose and it will probably be um, more able to get that diagnosis. So a more severe case can be relatively easy to diagnose. Um, and so a general paediatrician may well be able to make that diagnosis um, with the input of a usually a psychologist, um, occupational therapist, someone who's used to seeing kids with autism. And so that would be relatively straightforward. Um, a developmental paediatrician may also be involved depending on where you live and what that looks like. You usually need people who are experienced in assessing autism in the context of kids who may have cognitive difficulties and developmental delays. And so that is where you really need potentially skilled OT psychologists and um, speech and language therapists to actually try and tease out those things a little bit. And really the gold standard for a um, developmental assessment and a diagnosis, particularly a dual diagnosis, is where you need a multidisciplinary assessment or, and that usually is in the context of a paediatrician, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist and a psychologist. Now that's not always easily available depending on where you live. And so the really key aspects are just collecting information from different people and talking to a paediatrician would probably be your first steps who can then help you, or if you haven't already, gather information from occupational sensory and play assessments or from local psychologists will be the key aspects to that. And depending on how much language a child has, um, a language understanding, particularly of how 
children might be using language is really important. So play-based assessments, and this is where we look at those things called like joint attention and how kids play and what they use objects for. One of the things that we use um, sometimes is something called the ADOS. So that's an autism diagnostic observation schedule. Now it on its own is not diagnostic of autism, but it gives us an opportunity to observe a structured play environment to look at whether kids might meet those criteria that we talked about before. It examines how Charles relates to a carer and to their parents and to how they approach toys and play. And it looks at some of those repetitive movements and things as well. So it's important to realize everybody's different and that is never more true than when you have dual diagnoses because you have the opportunity then to be different with both Down syndrome and within the autism spectrum. So there's lots of, um, you know, challenges in trying to understand um, how a child is presenting. I think it's really important that at some stage, it's important to get a good idea of a child's strengths and difficulties. So thinking about what your child actually can do and is good at because really and truly it's the strengths that give you the clues as how to intervene to manage the difficulties none of us are good at everything and really it's a sort of way of trying to ameliorate the challenges that some of these kids you know to have so if you have for example a child that actually loves music but is really, really irritated when they're in the car. You can use the music to actually support that irritability within a car environment. So understanding strengths is really important. It's really important for education to know how to teach kids. So if somebody's particularly visual, which often kids with autism are, it's really important then to understand how to set up visual schedules, those sorts of things, okay? Um, and will help you sort of think about where to target some of those therapies. Lots of causes around autism, I'm not going to go into that. Um, one of the sort of biggest things people think about at the moment is that autism is really an over-connectivity of the brain with lots more connections or a failure of pruning, if you like. Um, and so, you get a sort of hyper hot wired sort of brain. And that's why it's also really common that lots of kids with autism have a dual diagnosis with ADHD because they're really hot wired. And that the sort of limitation and pruning of how these nerves interact with each other is really not there and not as organized as it should be. And so that's where you get that sort of common co-occurrence. So the focus, why, why do you need a diagnosis? You already have a diagnosis of Down syndrome, okay? Why do you need a diagnosis? Well, there's people that will argue in different directions, okay? And it's, it's, it's okay not to have a diagnosis. The main reasons might be and I'm trying to put myself in a parent's shoes here a little bit, is really to understand and support some access to therapy that might be more ASD focused. And so it's really about supporting other people to understand what your child might respond to in a better way. And so really in that circumstance, a label for a label's sake, to me is not necessarily always useful unless you understand those strengths and difficulties of your child specifically. So that's, that, that's really important. I'm not a great fan of labels without understanding of how that individual has strengths and difficulties within those labels. It's important to realize at this point in time, we have no cure for autistic spectrum disorder, but understanding if a child has those features may modify approach to therapies. 
And we do know that intensive behavioural support can modify outcomes for kids with ASD. So it can improve some of those social skills. So it can improve some of the communication. Whether it is related to a child learning certain patterns of behaviour or learning ways to cope with things, even though they might still find it challenging, is another question that I don't think we understand very well yet. Most of the treatments or therapies that we use in autism, the real focus is on symptom reduction and improving outcomes. There's no cure per se. So what might help? And I, I might just skim over this because we're going to share these slides as well a little bit. So in terms of seeking a diagnosis, really important to think about the additional needs your child has and how you might sort of want support with that. Thinking about routines and visual timetables for kids with dual diagnosis can be really important because if you can imagine that everything going on around you is really irritable. Um, you really don't understand what people are on about, then actually that's going to induce anxiety in any of us and you can't get your message across. So really providing a really clear structure, trying to keep kids informed as to what's happening, giving kids plenty of warning, those sorts of things are really important. Encouraging communication skills, however small those steps might be, are really important. Focusing on teaching independence and self-help skills as the kids get a little bit older. Um, even if those self-help skills might be simple things on how do I ask for help? You know, those sorts of things can be really important. Um, engaging kids with multiple people is important to try and decrease the reliance on a single person. Um, and prevent burnout for parents is really important. Um, limiting as much as you can some of the time in repetitive behaviour so they don't completely take over the child's world. And sticking with daily routines, do set clear expectations for behaviour. I think that's um, important. And then this slide really just talks about some of the features of successful intervention strategies. So. It's usually a combination of behaviourally orientated strategies with developmental and educational approaches, which is really key, but relevant to an individual's profiles of skills as well as deficits. So using skills to manage the things that you find tricky, okay? Um, you know, a prime example of that, if you relate it to the typical world is, for example, you know, I am not the most athletic person. I've never done anything very athletically. But at school, we all had to take part in something. So I found something where I didn't have to run. Okay, so I managed to be the goalie in the team. You know, so you, you use your skills or, you know, things to actually manage the things that you're not so good at and find places where you will fit. Um, and I think that's where that in understanding is really important. The need for really structured based teaching with visual cues, I think is really important. Um, development of social communication play activities. And, you know, some of these kids might not feel comfortable in social situations and forcing them into social situations all the time might not be necessarily something that suits them but if they can learn the basics of how to get through things that will be okay and that can be rewarded with time that they actually like. Um, acknowledgement of some of the undesirable behaviours may be either um, challenges for their communication to um, let you know their distress or the environment usually. Um, Understanding the importance of some of those rituals and obsessions and treatment that are focuses within the family rather than specifically being with the child often are, you know, as another feature of successful interventions. And really 
management strategies that can be implemented consistently without excessive sacrifice of time, money, and other aspects of family life. There is nothing that replaces a happy family life and the minimum amount of stress that you can have at home. I am consistently on a weekly basis giving people permission to stop therapy for a while, have a therapy break, you know, actually learn to play games. You know, this is not, you know, nobody, and forgive the therapists in the room, one-on-one -on -one therapy with these kids is not the only way to move forward. And actually, if it's at the expense of happy parents and a family that's relaxed and chilled, it's not a positive intervention. So, and the other thing I say is that if it costs more than your mortgage, it's probably not gonna work. So it's, there's a lot of hocus pocus out there and it's really important to think very carefully about that balance of you know, funding and things. Most successful interventions are usually have these features, but there are a lot of charlatans out there that will um, you know, make things cost a lot because they're out to make a buck. And actually most of us in the general health system really only have a limited number of things we have to be able to support families. So people can be a bit vulnerable to spending a lot of money on things that aren't really evidence-based. So, you know, you, you know, I'd value the value of a holiday to the beach for people over and above some things, okay? So really important to just weigh those things up very carefully about the excessive sacrifice of time, money and aspects of family life because nothing can replace a happy mum, dad and siblings. I think they're absolutely key. How to seek help. I think the important thing, it doesn't matter who you see in the health system. The main thing is to explain your concerns openly, you know, and be upfront about it. Don't dance around, you know, I'm worried my child might have, you know, they are doing this, which doesn't seem typical for a child with Down syndrome. Um, should I be getting it investigated? Who would I go to? How would I do it? Those sorts of things are really important to think about. Now, there are some people who may not want to sort of go down that route, um, but I think you've got lots of options. You know, if you're talking to GPs, there may be other ways you can access that. You know, asking for a referral to a pediatrician, you know, I would think should be fairly mainstream um, for um, children with, um, Down syndrome. And I think the more you can come from the point of wanting to understand your child and how this sits to be able to better support them, the more buy in you'll have from professionals. There are a number of people that are a bit jaded in the system, and I'm just being completely honest here about this push, push, push to have a label of autism so you can get funding, which is particularly prevalent through, you know, um, the education systems, you know, all of these things which really, you know, put people off a little bit. So if, you know, I think you come from that point of view of wanting to understand your child and what do these behaviours mean so that you can better support, you'll get really good buy-in from that perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the we get we get letters on a weekly basis saying the NDIS needs a label to be able to support my child. Absolutely not. Okay, and I would fight that to the teeth. I have a little paragraph on the bottom of my letters to the NDIS that say this child does not require a label. This is their functional impairments. And so describing how your child is impaired, so their difficulties, which is another problem I have with the NDIS, you have to describe all the bad stuff to get the help. 
you know, saying how your child really struggles with communication, all of those things are actually more important than a label. And if they refuse you because you don't have a label, then I think you've got a point to argue, okay? Um, sit down and think about the behaviours of concern and write down what you're concerned about because we know as doctors that every time a patient comes to see us, A, they'll forget 80% of the things they wanted to talk to us about and B, they'll take away 10% of the things that we told them. And it's usually the bad stuff that families take away. So it's really important, I think, to write stuff down so that you tell us everything that you're concerned about. So take some time the day before you come, you know, the weeks before, jot down little things that are worrying you, things that might be of concern. Thinking about some of these things I've talked about today and then seeing where you may have observed behaviours that might fit into those sort of profiles. Okay. Think about the cognitive level as well. So, you know, I've had um, some kids with, you know, syndromes and things referred to me about, you know, them having terrible behaviour. And when you go into the behaviour, it was really tantrums and tantrums about communication. And actually, it wasn't particularly a child with Down syndrome, but a similar sort of syndrome. And actually, when you thought about the cognitive level of that child, even though they were still in primary school, their cognitive level was around two to three. So adopting a positive behaviour support plan around tantrums actually sorted that problem out immediately. So thinking about the cognitive level at the same time is really useful. So areas to think about, I'm just going to go through because otherwise Sarah's going to completely run out of time. So hyperactivity and attention, common co-existing um, with ASD and Down syndrome, sleep problems, feeding problems, sensory problems, unusual movements, anxiety, and other co-occurring medical things. So all of those things are important to think about when you're writing a little list before you go and see the doctor. That's the end of my little bit. Sorry, I can talk under wet cement. Well, you certainly know a lot in this area. So we are very grateful for all of that talking. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Husler. Sarah, are you happy to just have a bit of a chat now around your experiences wearing, you know, which either of those hats that you'd like to share about? Maybe one, both, <laughs> um, whatever works best for you. Because I would imagine you've seen a lot personally and professionally in this space as well yes I have um I'll try and just tell a quick story I guess about um about my experience um so I've been a pediatric OT I've been working in um in healthcare with people with Down syndrome um and autism and other mental health trauma lots of dual diagnosis work and I've been doing that since 1989 was my first um job so it makes me feel very old um and I'm you know it's okay <laughs> <laughs> from going back through you know I used to work in London and child development centers where we would diagnose quite complex children and um I worked at Great Ormond Street Hospital for kids in neurology there so then I moved over to Australia and I worked as a children's therapist here and managed a local um OT department and things like that and then had a child with Down syndrome and went whoa okay so sat in the other chair on the other side of services and and struggled to be in that seat very much I found that very hard um, and then as time went on I think um, my little boy was about five months old and then um, he just didn't seem to be able to see. And we had a visit from Vision Australia who said, look, he's basically blind. And that was the start of a whole different journey. They were like, he's got a severe visual impairment. He had nystagmus. He couldn't focus or fixate on anything. And so then he had a brain scan, which um, they said, oh, well, this is the problem here. His, um, his corpus callosum, so the middle bit of the brain between the two hemispheres, hasn't developed. So down near his optic nerve, there's really nothing. So that's possibly why he's got these visual things going on. So the OT in me was like, oh, man, we've got work to do here. Like, what am I going <laughs> to do? 
<laughs> with this, you know, brain, the two hemispheres aren't talking to each other and I know they need to because um, otherwise he's not going to be able to get anything done. He's not going to be able to coordinate and all of those kinds of things. And then uh, when he was just, oh, he just turned one and I had his little brother. So I had them very close together. And um, little did I know when they were, you know, naught and one, one and two, two and three, I didn't actually know they both had autism, ADHD, <laughs> all the anxiety that went with that, sleep disorders. So over time then, you know, it really is a story of diagnoses and many, many, many of them. Um, and, you know, that was really fascinating because the Down syndrome was one thing. And we'd done our grieving and we'd done our acceptance and we felt we'd done all this stuff. But as we all know, as soon as, you know, the shit hits the fan again, all that comes up again and it's hard again. And, and then we kept getting more information um, and a different diagnosis for something new every time we went to see anybody. Um, and then when, when, his, when his younger brother, um, he was told that we were told when we knew he was struggling, um, that he had to repeat kinder and by this stage his his brother was at school and so I had a whole year with him um the younger brother who didn't have down syndrome um and I thought well he's a bit quirky and you know he's had to kind of battle for attention with his brother who struggled and gone to therapy and you know we dragged both of them around to different things and and all the rest of it and then you know it just became really obvious that he needed to be assessed for autism so when he got diagnosed and he had you know um oppositional defiance disorder as well as ADHD um, anxiety sleep disorder all these things and and then it became really I suppose we started to really look at our eldest son then and go, actually, it's not just Down syndrome going on with you. His vision by this stage had, had come reasonably good. He had quite bad nystagmus, but he could see and he was starting to tolerate wearing glasses. So, you know, he was kind of, but we were like, you know, actually we know and I knew um, that, you know, you're a lot more likely to have a child with ASD if there's other people in the family. We started looking around the family going, yeah, I reckon they've got it, I reckon they have. And my husband and I go, you're so ADHD, you're off the charts. Well, you know, that's actually an autism trait when you do that. So it became this kind of quite a humorous part of our journey, um, diagnosing the whole family and having a giggle. Um, but, you know, that was one of the, the big things that we started to look at as well was how does this actually stack up and then was the big question was what is there any point in having a diagnosis and it you know he was actually eight our eldest was eight when he got diagnosed with autism and by then he was in mainstream school um and you know we'd already kind of said look he, he's not he's not it's not just down syndrome that's affecting him there are some other things he also had a fluctuating hearing loss he had sleep apnea and he couldn't wear the, the the CPAP mask so he wasn't sleeping so he was up half the night and you know that affected his behavior so there was, it was very very complicated but still there was enough there when he was eight for us all to kind of go yeah you know or autism spectrum disorder needs to be on his on his sheet on his list um and from my point of view the biggest bonus for a diagnosis and I'm not one for diagnoses either I'm very I'm an OT I'm very functional um but the big thing for me was he was at a mainstream school with you know, support staff who didn't necessarily have an awful lot of skills and training. Um, and so it was easy to say, read up on Down syndrome, but read up on autism. Because if you only read up on Down syndrome, you're going to miss a lot of yeah. really good advice in how to educate him. Because if you look at the autism stuff, you'll probably find that's more helpful. And I feel like without that diagnosis, the education system being what it is, possibly wouldn't have got to some of the stuff that they got to um, around how to encourage his communication and using visual schedules and self-regulation and all of that kind of stuff which they you know they did take on board because and they then they were kind of used to some of that with their autism population anyway 
So I think that was really helpful. I mean, if I'm honest, if he was going to the local special school, I, you know, I've worked in special schools as well, and I kind of know how they set up their, their classrooms and their systems and their visual schedules and all the rest of it. And I think they could probably have accommodated him and they would probably have picked his autism as well pretty easily across the room. And he would have been educated in a way, you know, that may have had a better understanding that it wasn't just the Down syndrome that needed to be considered. Whereas I think in mainstream schools, you know, the more information you can give them, the more things they can look up, the more PDs they can go on. You know, they're not in that environment where um, they're setting things up for the autism community to be able to come in and succeed. Those classrooms aren't set up like that. So you need to help them get them set up like that. Um, so, you know, I just uh, personally and having worked with that, you know, it's a small local school and they've been fantastic. But I, I really feel that those extra diagnoses, the ADHD as well, which I feel or, you know, often goes hand in hand from the kids I've known. Um, you know, that was the bit that helped them say, OK, so when he has done some work, he does need to go and bounce the basketball and then come back in. You know, he does need to do something else. He does need to run an errand. And he has different things. He's in grade six now. Um, and he has different things that he does in the school to help regulate um, you know they 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 now I mean he's he's 12 um, but they still only have you know two or three visuals on his desk that he's going to do some math or he's going to do some reading and then he's gonna bounce the basketball and, and they're still working on a and fairly um, you know small schedules for him that he can go okay it's basically you know first this then this um and and that's that's you know really helpful those kinds of things that they've they've learned to do um and you know look professionally i now run i i started just working on my own when the boys were sort of two and three and i i sent them to daycare for a day a week um i was you know, I was pretty much falling apart. Um, so I was like, I just need to go back to work for a bit. And national registration had come in and I trained in England. And my friend rang me. She said, if you don't get back to work, you're going to struggle. So I was like, OK, I'm going to do something. And I just started a day a week. And, and you know, private practice um, and paediatrics has, you know, it's rocketed and we grew very, very quickly and now we have 11 OTs and three speech as a dietitian um, and we run a lot of outdoor programs so the programs that uh, kids with Down syndrome and dual diagnosis and, and those kind of more complex children are enjoying are very functional you know we do bike riding we've taught several kids with Down syndrome um, to ride bikes and things like that you know um, we include animals we include lots of cooking and gardening and nature-based programs and things like that. And I couldn't agree more with what you said, Dr. Honey, about sometimes just don't do therapy. So have a break. And especially for these diagnoses, we, are, we all know we're in it for the long haul. You don't need to cram it all in. You know, we've got plenty of time to do it. And, you know, don't let people over-service you and talk you into stuff. Everyone should, and everyone that's any good will have a wait list. So move on, you know, have a break. Say, look, I don't mind going, but I don't want to go back to the beginning of the wait list. Can we have a break and come back? Can we just do OT and not OT and speech and we'll do speech next term? You know, I think to think things like that is really helpful. And, you know, whatever, whether you need a, more diagnoses or whether you don't, sometimes it's about folks, so what are we focusing on here? So if you do get, you know, a diagnosis of ASD as well, why are you getting it? What are you doing with that? What education do you then need? Do you want to say, let's spend a term just understanding what this autism piece is about? Because actually it's new to us. So what do we actually need to know about that? What, what do we need to learn? What do we need to Im implement at home that we haven't been doing based on just, you know, well, what do kids with Down syndrome generally need? You know, what extra stuff? And, and you know, we try and take a bit more of a, what does he need to learn at the moment? And how who's the best person to do it? And sometimes it's us, you know, and I'm really lucky. You know, we, I've got a great husband and, and, you know, the NDIS has worked well for us because we've managed to do some different things um, with, with our boys who both have some funding. But also we kind of go, you know what, we don't want to be going to lots of appointments every week. 
Um, and it's one of the reasons that my practice does a lot of things outside and not on technology, um, because we want kids to get their hands dirty and get their hands in the hay and, you know, do do those kinds of activities. Because I don't want to drag my kids around, you know, clinical waiting rooms all their lives. It's not what we want to be doing through childhood. Um, so, you know, that kind of, um, and, and, you know, it doesn't mean that services like this are easy to find, um, but, you know, going to the beach or going to the forest or going to the bush on your own and, and digging and making things and, and those kind of things can, you know, it's that thing of giving yourself permission that you, you can actually do a lot of that um, as a parent and it's just play and it's just parenting and it doesn't need to be done right and you know there's no special way to do it you just sometimes got to get in there um, and I look at you know I look at my son now you know 12 years old a long list of, of issues but he's he's happy at mainstream school He's trialed special school. I had nothing against it. He had stuff against it. He didn't like it. So we went back to the mainstream school um, and he's happy enough there. He can drop in at the skate park. He's got a coach and he holds his little finger, but he can drop in at the skate park on the ramp. He can ride a pony. He can ride a push bike. Um, he can make toast. You know, he's learned to do all sorts of things despite all of his diagnoses. So, you know, it's not necessarily an, oh, my God, you know, how oh, there's so much else. Could anything else go wrong if this wasn't bad enough? It's actually not. It's a window to more information, um, a bit more help. And sometimes there is a bit more funding or a service you couldn't previously access because it was mainly for people on the spectrum. Um, you know, and you can still go for all of those things that they're interested in and all of those um, strengths that they've got and even if they're not functioning at that level that they're going to be you know I'm lucky the ADHD has made him very strong and although we medicate that now so he can come down a bit for learning for many years he just spent so long running spinning jumping on the trampoline it's actually made him physically quite strong um, but you know even if your kids aren't like that they still have interest they they everybody can do something Everybody has strengths and things that they believe in. And, and it's making sure that the therapy taps into that um, and that you're not trying to, you know, tap these square pegs into round holes. We don't need to. You know, we can have a shape sorter with every kind of hole for every kind of shape. And it's just working that out so that we're not trying to always whack them into shape for someone else. Um, but really going with their strengths and doing those those strengths and needs kinds of lists are really helpful when you're looking into your therapy and your functional, their functional needs, you know, that um, they need to be able to learn this so they can do this, you know, they need to be able to, um, you know, they need to be able to walk because they're really interested in, you know, doing this kind of activity which requires them to do walking and, and they're, you're more motivated because you know why you're doing it. It's not just because it's, you know, an NDIS goal or, you know, all those goals need to be carefully considered. And all of the therapy should always, if NDIS are paying for it and they have set very good goals with you, then all of your therapy should, any therapist should be able to say, I'm working on that goal. And they should know exactly how they're working on it. And you should get regular reviews around if, if what they're doing is effective and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, aside a little bit from the diagnosis, but, you know, um, getting more funding, sometimes, you know, that happens because your child is seen to be more complex than before. Uh, but it shouldn't be. It should be around what they need. And what they need this year won't be the same as what they need next year or last year. You'll have phases where you want to do more and you need to. You've got another diagnosis. You need to understand it. You might need more education. Things might need to be set up by therapists at school, at home, in different environments, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then, you know, the following year, you might go, you know what? We don't need to do all that. It's up and running now. Let's have more of a consolidation period where, you know, we actually chill out a bit and we spend a bit more time with the other siblings doing some different stuff. So definitely, you know, loads to think about and, and getting another diagnosis does throw stuff up for you emotionally, usually, um, because although it can be a great relief that someone's listened, that we look, we thought there was more going on here and, and often, you know, parental in, intuition's right. Um, and so that can be a relief, but also on a bad day, it can, you know, raise up some of that stuff of, geez, 
this is tough. It's going to be tough for a while. Um, but, you know, look, we've had we've had nothing but good come out of getting more information, certainly, for our son. So I think that's been the theme between both of you tonight is that the importance of doing this so that it gains better understanding and, and shines a light on the strengths that your little person um, has, despite however many co-occurring, you know, labels there might might or might not be. Um, so I just did want to ask one question, Sarah, if I may, and if it's too personal, please just say so. But we do hear from a lot of families who have gone through that um you know, secondary or third diagnosis and say that the grief comes all over again, mm -hmm. um, the whole processing of it, and that sometimes they don't feel necessarily that they fit in either, you know, mm -hmm. um, the community of families who have children with Down syndrome and, and the autistic community. So, I mean, I'm wondering, is that something that you, you know, have you got any suggestions on where people might be able to find some sort of um, support around that other than their local associations? <laughs> Look, it is really difficult and you do feel like you don't belong in one or the other. I mean, I've got having the two boys is fascinating to me because when they were little and they were struggling very much with their behaviour out in the community and there was me, you know, <laughs> providing a service of advice to others and I had no control. I'd be weeping in the bananas in the fruit aisle in the supermarket. I mean, it was awful. One in one direction, one in the other. You'd literally run to get one under the arm go and get the other it was bum shuffling down somewhere else you know I mean it was pretty difficult and but one of the things that was interesting was when I had Ike who's my boy with Down syndrome and um, people would be very supportive they would there might have been a bit of pity in their eyes which I didn't always need but they would see I was a mum struggling with a big story and it was obvious because he looked like he had Down syndrome when I was out only with my other son people would look at me like I was a terrible mother and a completely different response from the community. And then I got to know other kids with, you know, um, just autism through most of my, my other son's friends have, have autism. They've just banded together and they've got their own little way of communicating. Um, and they're awesome. And mostly they're, you know, they're fairly bright. They're doing OK. Um, but I don't feel, it fit, feel like we fitted in with their parents either because we weren't just that family you know, with these quirky, fairly high functioning kids on the spectrum. So we didn't really fit. We still don't fit anywhere. So I don't have a lot of advice for that other than accept not fitting and feel okay about it. <laughs> you know, um, we're a quirky family. I embrace it now. And I think it makes it difficult to know um, who your tribe is. I think that can be really difficult because most people, you know, when they're in our kind of generation, you know, in your, in your 30s, 40s, I'm 50, you know, now. But, you know, in that age range, people are banding together often because of who their kids are getting along with. And, you know, in the, in the disability world, it's around the support groups you can access or that you have this thing in common. And then as you get rarer and rarer, you know, it's one in 10 of these children, then you, do, you can feel a bit like there's nobody else quite like us. Um, mm. Although through my work, I know that there are so many hundreds of people just in our neighbourhood who feel like there's nobody else quite like us. So the common denominator is everybody actually feels like there's nobody struggling with my shit because they're not. They're, they're struggling with something else. So I, I kind of go at it now personally to go everyone is struggling with something that is incredibly unique mm. and that can bring us together. Um, but it is, it is hard. It's hard to know who you can, you know, drop your kid off and say, can we just whiz down to do something and can I just drop it? I can't drop him anywhere really now. I mean, I just can't. He's too big. He's too, and he's, you know, and his behaviour can be quite tricky. So I don't, I haven't got those kinds of friends or that kind of community either, despite knowing lots of people. So, um, you know, I think that can be difficult. There is a, um, there is a Facebook group for um, kids with Down syndrome and autism, and I actually find that quite a supportive group. And just, you know, you might have a quick look at it in the morning and somebody's on there saying, you know, I'm just having the worst time. Can somebody tell me this is okay? And everybody gets back saying, yes, I feel exactly the same. So, you know, you can seek it where you can. 
but it's true. You're not probably going to find many other people in your local mm. community. Mm. Um, so that can be tricky to not fit in either camp particularly mm. easily. No, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm conscious of the time and thank you for those of you who've hung in there with us. If anyone has a question for either Sarah or um, Honey before we finish up, please feel free to pop it into the chat box. Um, and I am just going to pop in, um, uh, it's not working. I was going to put a survey link, but I'll just email that out to people who attended afterwards just to give us some feedback on tonight in terms of if there is follow-up information that people would like from us, um, you know, following on from this. I thank you both so much for your time, ladies. Um, it's been really fascinating. This topic always brings up um, so much new learning for myself as a um a supporter at Down Syndrome Queensland but also um we always get feedback from our families that any information because it is you know as you said Sarah rarer and rarer to have this you know particular overlay of two conditions um we really really are grateful for any information that's shared so um I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat so thank you both for your time and um yeah, um, I, Dr. Hussler, are you happy for anyone to have those slides? You mentioned earlier that you could, um, or would you I prefer? So. Yeah. I think so. It's mostly links. There's nothing yeah, there that just is a problem, I don't think. The resource I'll flick it through to you. Um, okay. Nadia. Yeah. yeah. If, if, they, if you can't, that's totally yep. understandable as well. But yeah, just in case anyone has follow up questions. And thank you, Sarah, too, for your um, personal and professional wisdom in this space as well. Thanks so much, everybody.